So we have an apneic pause between each of our cycles. When we inhale, there's an apneic pause. When we exhale, there's an apneic pause. Inhale, apneic pause. Exhale, apneic pause. As you dial in more and more respiratory rate, this may happen. Okay, now look at what happened over here. <gasps> Little apneic pause, but over here when the patient exhales, it does not come up to the x-axis and stay on the x-axis. Rather, it shoots across. So this guy goes, <gasps> <gasps> right? And this is referred to as auto peep or breath stacking. Same thing. And the reason this is happening is you've told that machine to breathe so much, you took that respiratory rate up to 30, let's just say, that's one breath every two seconds, there's not enough time for the person to exhale. Remember that exhalation is a passive process, takes time. So the machine will do whatever you tell it to do, which is, okay, give the air, but then give, give air again with insufficient time to exhale, and you will find that that's what that looks like. Now, does that matter? Depends. Depends how bad it is. If the, if the auto peep is significant, then yes, you can have issues related to the peep, which we're going to talk about in a second. If it's a small degree of auto peep, if it looks kind of like this, it really doesn't matter at all. But that's something to be aware of as you turn up the respiratory rate to try to defend the mid-ventilation. The piper to pay when you turn up the respiratory rate is auto peep. I need to be aware of that. Okay, so that's the conversation around mid-ventilation and auto peep. And tidal volume and kind of how you can figure all that out. Let's talk about FiO2 and PEEP. Obviously, we're going to start with an FiO2 of 100%. Oxygen is cheap. We're good to go. Let's talk about the PEEP. Generally speaking, everybody on the ventilator starts with a PEEP of 5. Now, there are three factors, three main factors, that affect oxygen exchange across the lung, by and large, three main factors. One is the FiO2. The more oxygen you give, the more oxygen you give. The second one is time. Because remember that it takes a long time for oxygen to diffuse across the alveolus. And the third one is surface area. And PEEP works on surface area. So if I've got one alveolus and it kind of looks like that, let's just say this is normal, here's five of PEEP. The idea is if this alveolus is full of debris, it could be pulmonary edema, it could be hyalinaceous debris like ARDS, it could be frank pus like pneumonia, it could be blood, alveolar hemorrhage, whatever. There's fluid in here. If I increase the pressure in the alveolus, and let's say I put in 15 of PEEP, then that same amount of water just dropped down because I've got a wider surface. It's like doubling the size of your swimming pool. Now I can use the sides of my alveolus for O2 exchange, okay? The problem with PEEP is it takes hours to work, not hours, but it takes a long time for it to kick in. Because you can imagine if I've got an alveolus and it's connected to other alveoli, right, and I just put in a little bit of a change in pressure over here, that change in pressure has to be dissipated throughout the alveolar tree, so any one little alveolus sees very little change in pressure. So what you don't want to do, here's what failure looks like, this is, do not do this. Failure is dialing in a setting that looks like that. If you're at 100% FiO2 with 5 a peep, and then the guy desaturates, you have no place to go. You've already used up your rapid deployment force, which is FiO2. So as your FiO2 crosses a number that makes you uncomfortable, depends what that number is for you, for me it's 60%. As my FiO2 starts to meet and exceed 60%, I start dialing up my peep. Increase peep. Okay? Generally speaking, PEEP is increased in aliquots of 2.5 to 5 centimeters of water. Okay? So as my FiO2 starts hitting 60%, I'm going to go from a PEEP of 5 to a PEEP of 8. As it starts to go to 70%, I'm going to go from a PEEP of 8 to a PEEP of 10. I'm going to bring the both up. Remember, this thing takes forever to kick in. This is fast. These guys are the Marines. They come in quickly. They kill you. Defend freedom. This is the Army. They hold fort and maintain freedom, but they take time, my friend, okay? So as this goes up, this goes up. That's the important part. There's a piper to pay. There's no such thing as free lunch. As you start to increase the peep, you have to look at another curve. This one's going to be the curve of pressure over time, okay? 
Um, kind of keep it simple. The curve may look something like this. It won't exactly look like that, but close enough. The peak pressure, the peak pressure that we want to tolerate is 40. We want to maintain a peak pressure less than 40 at all times, generally speaking. Okay? And here's your peak on the bottom, which is your positive and expiratory pressure, the bottom pressure. As you start to dial in peak, you can imagine if I raise the height of this box, I'm going to start exceeding the upper limit. So if I look at the ventilator and my peak pressure is 30, sure, dial up the peak. You've got plenty of room to go. But if I'm riding a peep, peak pressure of 40 and I start dialing in more peep, I'm going to exceed that 40 limit and I have to be careful of barotrauma, which could result in a pneumothorax. That's one thing. So look at the pressure curve as you start to increase the peep. The second thing is, as you start to increase the peep, especially when you get to peeps that are very high, like 20, so 20 peep would be considered an extremely high peep. You have to not only worry about a pneumothorax, you have to also have to worry that at that level, there's so much pressure in the chest that you're impeding venous return to the heart. And by impeding venous return to the heart, you will decrease cardiac output and therefore decrease blood pressure. So the things to worry about as I increase PEEP, the complications to worry about are number one, pneumothorax. Number two, hypotension. Okay, and then rarely, but does happen, you can actually have a paradoxical decrease in the O2 saturation if the PEEP is so high that you're actually collapsing the juxtaalveolar capillary beds. The alveoli are so big, they're actually compressing and squishing the, the capillaries, you're creating a shunt within the, uh, the lung. But the first two are the ones that are the most common that you'd have to worry about. Remember that the upper, so the upper limit of the PEEP pressure is about 40, the PEEP somewhere between let's say 18 to 20, these numbers vary depending on which doctor you talk to, is considered very high. Okay, and I would suggest to you, for my colleagues who are not full-time intensivists, once you start approaching peeps of 18-ish with FIO2s, which at that point in time I'm, I'm sure are 100%, we really should probably bring one of the core intensivists back into the game because this is a patient who's deteriorating and needs some help. A couple of last little uh, points that might help you out. If your patient is desaturating on you quickly, despite all your maneuvers, and you've ruled out things like pneumothorax, you know, endotracheal tube dislodgement, you're thinking to yourself, this is a lung problem. There's a couple of things you can do to try to buy yourself some time. So for a, a sudden desat, for a decrease in O2 sat, there are some pharmacologic adjuncts you can give. Number one, paralyze the patient. Obviously, the person's on the ventilator when you're going to give this drug, but if you paralyze them, give them 100 milligrams of rocuronium, it becomes supply and demand economics. The highest utilizer of oxygen in the human body is the skeletal muscle because there's just so much of it around. So if you, when you paralyze someone, you drop O2 demand, thereby for that same degree of supply, oxygen saturation will go up. So if you find somebody who's getting higher and higher on their PEEP, higher and higher on their FiO2, and you need some room, their O2 sats are 85%, go ahead and paralyze them. You might buy yourself about five percentage points or so in O2 saturation, that's one. The second one is you can prescribe an inhaled uh, arterial dilator. At George Washington, we tend to use Flolan, which is a prostacycline. Um, we give it inhaled so that when it goes down the endotracheal tube, it selectively goes to the alveoli that are aerated. It will not go to the ones that are full of debris and stuff. And therefore, it'll selectively dilate the arterioles that go to those alveoli. You're basically creating a VQ match again uh, and trying to augment you know, oxygen exchange that way. Two pharmacologic maneuvers that will improve oxygenation. Beyond that, once we get to things like prone therapy, APRV, and then the ultimate being ECMO, again, I think for, at, the, at those levels, we probably should get the uh, intensivist back into the game. So that's kind of the overview. Stick to PRVC. If you paralyze the guy, it becomes assist control. It doesn't really matter. The basic dials that you need to prescribe are respiratory rate times tidal volume. We talked about normal minute ventilation is 5 liters per minute. You need to pick something higher than that. 8, 10, 12, depends on where you are with the pH. We talked about how as the minute ventilation goes up, PCO2 goes down, and therefore pH goes up. So if you need your pH to go up, increase the product of these two one way or the other. If you increase tidal volume, beware of increasing pressure. Look at your pressure curve. More air equals more pressure. If you increase respiratory rate, look at your flow curve. 
more breath cycles means you're at risk for auto PEEP. And then we talked about FiO2 and PEEP. We mentioned that the FiO2 is your rapid force. It'll, it, it'll impact O2 quickly if it's going to, whereas your PEEP takes time to kick in. So as the FiO2 starts to come up, the PEEP should start to come up in tandem together. And again, as the PEEP comes up, beware of your peak pressure and look at the pressure curve to see how much room you have. That's kind of the overview. I'm happy to help. If anyone has any questions, please call me, Danielle, any of the full-time intensivists. And uh, thank you up front for uh, stepping up your game. Appreciate it.